higher than Saudi Arabia, higher than Oman, higher than the US, Germany, Japan, and China. So we have to do some work in Bahrain. It's really important for us to reduce carbon emission. Now, some figures from the UK, and I compared them with figures from the United States. Most consumptions for energy are in housing and in transport, infrastructure, to a large extent, the majority, more than 50, 60%. If we can handle buildings and infrastructures, we'd be able to reduce the carbon emission. And these are universal figures in Europe and in the United States. Now, sustainable development and environment, they rely on three components, leadership, innovation, and culture. Leadership, let me give you just some examples. Government initiatives, incentives for being uh, energy efficient. CIOB have Carbon Action 2050, an initiative. They have, they have toolkits on the website, you can use it. Some nations have developed green building councils. United States, other nations, Qatar produced one, I think. Now, innovation, let me share with you some projects. This is in the UK, in fact. This was at Salford University. We built in the university a house to mimic housing stock from 1919. There are two million houses in the UK built in 1919, which are not energy efficient. So they need renovation, they need retrofit. So we built a house on campus we spent about 700,000 pounds, and we're doing simulation for energy consumption, rain, uh, snow, and so on. This is what we should be doing here. We should have some labs. This is some work we have done on intelligent cities. If you go into a city, you know the energy consumption area by area, house by house. <clears throat> you can go and look at any area you want. You can check which one is energy efficient, which one is not. So there are plenty of things we can do. The culture, I think this is much more difficult in our part of the world. Uh, we need responsible citizenship for sure. A power distance uh, is not an egalitarian society. If you are a president of a university, you have to buy an expensive car and consume energy. In the UK, I don't think anybody will give a toss whether you have Hyundai i10 or Mercedes uh, whatever. Uh, this is part of our culture. We live with it, we accept it, but unfortunately we are hurting the environment. We are hurting our kids and the next generation. Uh, to, the, the value system needs to change a little bit. Maybe some taxation on energy consumption could be really useful. And education, start with school kids. In the UK, they teach their kids how to go to school. When they leave the house or the office or whatever, they switch off the light. I remember my two daughters used to say to me, that switch off the light. They're teaching them at school, switch off the light, you don't need it. Scenario planning for the future, I think global environmental change will affect, without any doubt, the way people behave globally and the financial market. And this is one scenario for you. Resources will need to be managed, government will need to interfere for, to control the environment, in fact, there will be taxation. And the economic model will be by intervention not market-driven. So you will end up with a scenario here, which what we call it in the UK at some stage, cuddly dictatorship. So the government will decide everything for you. You like it, you don't like it, you can complain, but you have to do it. If you are a little bit fat, I'm really slim, you pay more money because more likely you'll go to hospital. If you consume more energy, you'll pay more money. It's gonna happen everywhere, I think, because the whole world will run out of energy at some stage. So this is what we call it, why cuddly dictatorship. It's nice, they hug you, but they say pay money and pay taxation. So how do we create sustainable environment? We need to change our curriculum in universities. We need government and policies clear. Businesses to be on our side. The academic community has to promote a business of sustainable environment and community schools in particular. But of course the problems to overcome, resistance to change, Business case is not clear, you cannot quantify it, poor leadership in general, lack of policies, and lack of skills, research and development, especially in our part of the world. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research and development centers which are dealing with energy efficient. I know there's one in, uh, in, in UAA, Masdar Institute, they're doing a lot of good work, but we need more centers in this area. The future is based around innovative products, capacity to deal with environmental issues, innovation, innovative leaders, and processes to be in place. 
So possible solutions, at least for Bahrain, if possible. I hope that somebody will listen to me. This is how they started in the West and in Japan. They built up energy towns, energy efficient towns or villages. They started by relying more on recycling, solar energy, public transport, efficient cars, intelligent buildings where you can switch the light on and off, taxation, you pay more money for using more energy and by educating their kids. This is what they did in Japan and in the West. I hope in Bahrain somebody will start a small village, an eco village, an energy efficient village and apply some of these rules. Of course, you need leadership, you need innovation and we need to change the culture and the culture is the hardest one for all of us. So to conclude, the future is in sustainability, no question about it. I'm sure David Anthony will agree with me yesterday he was questioning. Uh, focus on the big picture and address the leadership, innovation and cultural issues, please. Culture in particular. There are some really exciting technologies now, simulation technologies, what if scenario, you can simulate the whole environment and look at energy consumption, make your buildings energy efficient. At least I know our colleagues and students at ASU have started to switch off the light when they don't need it and have started to switch off their conditioning when they don't need it. That's all I think. Thank you very much. And now, dear guest, let's watch this short movie which shows how ASU building is environmentally friendly. Unfortunately, it's in Arabic, but pictures speak sometimes louder than words. Mr. Donward, the Chief Executive of Constructing Excellence in UK, will now be invited to deliver a keynote address on the UK experiences in the area of sustainable buildings and infrastructure. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I've been asked to talk about UK experience. Um, I must congratulate Professor Waqib on your magnificent building and facilities here, and thank you, for, for, thank you indeed for the video. Um, 
Of course, in the UK, our challenge is space heating rather than space cooling. Um, but I hope uh, some, of, some, of the, uh, some of the experience is going to, is going to be relevant. My organisation is a not-for-profit think tank and best practice organisation, uh, primarily in the UK, focused on driving change and improvement in, in the industry, particularly, as I hope to explain, uh, through all aspects of collaborative working, of, of getting this industry to work better together from the initial process of a brief and financing of a project through design, construction, commissioning, operation, and, 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 and beyond. A whole life collaborative process. Three years ago, we began to realize that there are lots of organizations like ours around the world trying to work on the same sort of agenda. And we've put together an alliance of, of a number of these organizations in Scandinavia, in Australasia, um, and in the Far East. And um, we get tremendous value, as well as sharing with universities, we get tremendous value of sharing with other parts of the world who are leading in many different aspects of what we talk about. It's great just to share experience, share ideas, understand where leading best practice is, is at. And I'm particularly delighted to announce that the ninth member of that international alliance, uh, with effect from the 1st of June, is actually in Qatar. And so for the first time, Constructing Excellence has a presence here in the Gulf, and I do hope that um, conversations today around Bahrain will be able to also extend a lot of the ideas of best practice here in Bahrain uh, to, a wider, to a wider platform. In the UK, we've been working on trying to improve the industry for at least the last 20 years. A guy called Sir Michael Latham wrote a report in 1994 called Constructing the Team. And that tells you where he saw the, the challenge as being in, in improving our industry. In 1998, we had another report, Rethinking Construction. And today, we're still trying to rethink construction. There must be a better way of doing what we do to add more value in a more cost-effective way for the benefit of society, the planet, and the economy. And we're on to a new strategy, Construction 2025, which, which I hope to talk to you about. The UK has come a long way, but we've a long way to go. It, 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 it's a constant journey. This is one fantastic industry, as so many of you know. We, we affect every other aspect of life, of everybody's life. And it's our job to make this a world-class industry. Sustainability... I, there isn't enough time to give you, you'll be delighted to know a full lecture on what we would see from the UK as a picture of, of sustainability. But, but I think there's a couple of terms which have come into use, which are quite useful in, in, in developing the theme. One is the idea of the triple bottom line. If sustainability in the 90s was a lot about the planet, saving the planet, um, it was a lot about motivated by a recognition that excess carbon emissions were, were causing global warming, which was, which was contributing to climate change. We've moved on from that to understanding that there's an economic benefit to, uh, for businesses and for countries to be sustainable. There's a social benefit. And that triple bottom line really dominates what I'm going to talk about. I'm probably going to talk more about the social side and the, and the economic side than I am about the pure, the pure environmental. And nevertheless, as Gassan has already showed, carbon, energy consumption, waste, resource efficiency more generally are part of this. My early career was in energy consumption, in, in housing particularly, at the building research establishment in the UK. And, and, and that link with carbon only came along 15, 20 years ago. You know, it may be hard to, hard to believe. Before then, it was about energy consumption, resource efficiency. But the Kyoto targets from the 90s onwards have really focused the, the world on, on doing something about, about emissions. And the UK, of course, was the first country to pass into law a target for, for carbon dioxide emissions reductions, a target of 80% reduction in the UK by 2050. And interestingly, what that means is, although a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, is about new build in construction, new construction, in fact, for the UK, the challenge becomes, what do we do with our existing building stock? Because, for example, something like 90% of the housing that we will need in the UK by 2050 has already been built. And most of it is not good enough. 
at least not for the level of carbon performance that we're talking about. So how do you go around refurbishing and upgrading that amount of housing uh, over the next 30 years? If someone works out the business model for that, they will make a lot of money, by the way. Client side, you know, why what, construction clients, the people who invest, the people who need our buildings, the people who want to use our buildings for whatever, many different factors driving these people. And environmental sustainability or concern for the planet is perhaps one of them, but it isn't always one of them. But look at those sort of drivers. In the UK, this is what clients worry about, you know? They're coming along to spend massive investments in built environment. And they've got to worry about all of this stuff. At the end of the day, we're building buildings for 60, 100 years. And yet, some of the decisions we make early on, it's as if the next 60 years don't matter. All we're doing is, is, is designing and constructing for today. We have to take a much more whole life view of, of, of our buildings in order to be able to help our clients address a number of these issues. The growth of BREAM accreditation in, in, in the UK, which is, um, I mean, BREAM is in six, 72 different countries, but um, it, it, it is, if you like, the UK, UK, UK version of LEED that, that has already been referred to. Um, BREAM has grown in the UK over the last 20 years, particularly in the commercial office sector, where nobody today would build a commercial office building that wasn't at least excellent in BREAM standards. And the reason for that is, is future-proofing. When that office building next comes on the market for needing a, needing a tenant five, ten years' time, that building will be out-of-date, old-fashioned, hopeless and completely incapable of being let again unless it has that level today of environmental performance that we will need in 10, 20 years' time. So a lot of this dimension, a lot of the up to lead and bream and other similar rating systems it is around future-proofing for the client. Just a few words on one of the great showcases in the United Kingdom for, 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 for best practice in, in construction and, and, and sustainability there, therein. The London 2012 Olympic Games was a, tr was a tremendous Olympic Games, I hope you'd agree, um, but it was an even better, in many respects, an even better construction program. 9.3 billion pounds was budgeted to be spent. We managed to spend about 10% less than that because of good practice, and um, I hope you'll be persuaded by some of the uh, innovation and, and ideas that constructing excellence and others um, brought to the party. There are websites galore on what we learned at the Olympics, and there's just one of the, the links, and all this collateral London 2012 sustainability lessons learned, the UK Green Building Council, all sorts of information to be downloaded. We introduced, I think the Olympics was the first time the word legacy really I thought I saw being used as, the, as a way of talking about sustainability. The Olympic Games was just a, a journey in terms of the ultimate goal for London, which was to bring into use a regenerated, awful, frankly, part of East London, and to create a whole new quarter, a whole new community, now known as the Queen Elizabeth Park. And, and the Olympic Games was great, but it wasn't the reason for spending nine billion pounds. I don't think anybody could really have justified that, that amount of money. What we got was a legacy a legacy in terms of a new city, a legacy in terms of a feel-good factor for Britain in, in, in terms of a great games. But we got a better construction industry, and we've written the, all sorts of guidance around what we learned. And they did focus very heavily on sustainability in that program, and as I, you can see, some of the dimensions of sustainability there which were which were addressed in the in the project some of the outcomes we achieved that's that project that program of about 40 major projects employed some 40,000 people 20% um, came from the local community this was a this was an area of five london boroughs with very high unemployment construction is a very good industry for putting for for bringing jobs quickly to a new area when an investment is made that's about sustainability that's about quality of life. Employment is a crucial dimension in the UK of, of, um, of sustainability. We targeted 1,000 apprenticeships. We didn't quite make that, actually, but we got nearly to 1,000 new entrants into our industry trained up. We had an accident rate, for those of you who follow these things, spectacularly lower than even the UK had been able to achieve 
to that, to that time. We had 2,000 workers a month being seen by occupational health people. Sustainability in terms of the healthcare of our workforce is a crucial dimension in creating a world-class industry. We had 98% recycling of demolition materials. We had 50% carbon reduction on those projects compared with the, with the norm, 50% plus water, water reduction, and an awful lot of very interesting archaeology, actually, as well, preserving, preserving, preserving the, the past. Now, the Olympics are all very well. You know, it's a one-off project for the UK, probably, and, um, but the, 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 there are two benefits from a massive program like that, setting the bar as high as it did. One is that it influences the, mega, the next big program of work. And in the UK, the Olympics gave us a lot of confidence that we're starting to get quite good at delivering these sorts of mega programs. And what you've got on site now is a major investment in Crossrail, which is a new, the first railway across London for 100 years. We're just about to start constructing a new fleet of nuclear power stations. These are all projects which are notoriously risky, notoriously difficult to deliver on cost, on time, let alone with any respect for the environment. And every time these projects set the bar for the next to follow, and the teams move from one of these projects to the next. You know, there are, there are teams from, from our London Olympics over in, in Qatar work, working on, on, on the World Cup program. That these, these mega projects feed almost an industry of themselves, which move international best practice forward. But the other benefit for us is how do we take the learning down to a more normal size of project, if you like, something that's more typical. Something, and, and, and from that point of view, we run a demonstrations program applying all these ideas, the ideas that were the Olympics yesterday, are the ideas of the normal industry, as it were, as were today, covering all sectors, regions, sizes of project, um, covering new build, covering refurbishment, covering housing, civil engineering. And when we start looking at the sector as a whole, what you see in the UK over the last 10, 15 years is some interesting examples where we've made big progress and other examples where we still stubbornly refuse to get to, to, to too much better. One of our strongest points, one of the things we would be most proud of is that our safety performance in the UK construction industry is now 70% better than it was 15 years ago. If you want to talk about sustainability, if you want to talk about a world-class industry, you have to talk about an industry which is safe. An industry where someone goes to work and goes home to their family in the evening alive. We've still a way to go until there are no fatalities on UK construction sites, no serious accidents. We, our industry will not be sustainable. Any industry with a license to trade has got to sort this out. And we're doing our, you know, we're making progress as I hope you can see, but we've still a long way to go. And this is a crucial part of, of, of sustainability. Waste to landfill, frustratingly, there's, um, I, I mentioned 98% recycling, but actually across the UK, we're not doing that great. We still send an awful lot of construction waste straight to landfill. We pour it in a hole and we never use it again. That's a terrible waste of natural resource. So I'm absolutely not setting out, I wasn't, you know, I've never claimed you guys under, that UK was some sort of leading light here. I'm just sharing with you the UK good and the UK, you know, must do better uh, school report, if you like. One of the challenges we had six years ago now was, 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 a, was a major economic recession um, caused by... Um, I nearly made a political point then. Uh, probably caused by the world uh, financial crash. <laughs> um, and, and, and as ever, wherever you go around the world, if an economy goes into recession, the construction industry suffers more than most. As soon as confidence starts to suffer in the wider economy, demand for construction will fall. And that confidence has to rebuild, and the, so we will always be last out of recession also. Nevertheless, in construction, we're starting to see things picking up in the UK and the UK has probably done better, that our recession was probably less deep than other parts of, of Europe, and I'm in danger of a second political point there. Um, but um, but my, my, my point about this economic crash was it threatened a lot of progress. It's once an industry is hit by that amount of economic downturn, it moves into survival mode. 
the nice to have, a clients move into survival mode, they suddenly don't have the money. So they're either going to stop the project or they're going to start demanding 20% random cost savings on a, on a project which simply aren't there to be had in the project. Um, my point is that we had election and uh, government promises around being the greenest government in the UK ever uh, in 2010, and it's quite fair to say that we have not had the greenest government ever in the last five years. When we look at some of the targets, we were targeting all housing by 2016 to be zero carbon. We are nowhere near that target. Um, we aspire still to that sort of level of improvement. We are making improvement in zero carbon housing, or sorry, low carbon housing, um, driven a lot by the building regulations, I have to say, which are, which are legally mandated standards for housing, um, which is frustrating. I'd like to see the market moving ahead. I'd like to see, we'd all like to see a premium for higher quality, lower carbon, more energy efficient, warmer, safer, brighter homes. Um, but at the moment, our market is a little bit sluggish to, to respond to that sort of need. And so as I say, this climate change, economic climate change, if you like, really threatened uh, the speed of change in our industry. What I'm quite pleased about is we didn't appear to turn back on safety. The industry has remained at the level of performance of, um, that I showed earlier. Um, but what we see now is the industry is bizarre. It, it, we've almost come so fast out of that recession. We're now in the UK talking about a skill shortage in the construction industry. This is another das aspect of sustainability. How can you be sustainable if you don't have enough people to feed your industry to, to, to come and do the work? So there are two dimensions here. One is we're on a big campaign to recruit more people into a more attractive, modern, safe, sustainable industry. Um, we're the biggest single employer in the UK when you add up construction, construction sectors. And we have a most amazing array of careers from finance and law and all those sorts of disciplines through to some of the, the, the CIOB's professions, through to manufacturing, installation, you, 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 you name it. And when you look at what young people are interested in, this is stuff that the construction industry can feed in. I challenge you to find another industry able to tick those boxes better than the construction industry built environment and property property industries. You know, the younger generation of today is into IT. It gets the concern for the planet. It gets social media fairness in society. And we've got an opportunity in construction. Boy, oh boy, do we need it, because we've got some pretty big skill shortages at the moment. And let's face it, we create absolutely amazing products right around the world. Join the construction industry and see the world might, 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 might be one of, our, one of our strap lines. And more importantly, join the construction industry and build the world build the future. That's what we do. That's what everybody in this room aspires, aspires to do. We use amazing technology uh, in doing that. So the social dimension of recruiting good people into our industry really is about some of this messaging. Which other industry is actually going to save the planet? At a very, very local level, a micro level, I just thought I'd share with you a quick one, which is uh, the, the theme of social value. A lot of construction is spent in the UK by municipalities, by local authorities. It's spent in a local area. It's spent in a local area, maybe investing in a school or a hospital. So construction is the industry, above all else, which employs local people. For every pound spent on construction, something like three pounds is returned as an economic multiplier in the UK construction sector. This is the highest economic multiplier just about of, of, of any sector. And this has made a compelling argument to government as well as to, to local clients for employing construction companies. It's also made a compelling argument for employing smaller, more local companies as well as, as, well as larger international uh, companies. Um, just, 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 just one to reflect on. Final one on uh, carbon, um, an interesting one for clients or those of you who are influencing clients. Anglian Water is a water supply company uh, covering the, roughly speaking, the east of England. Um, Anglian Water um, is in a very green, very agricultural, very rural part of, of England. And their values include environment, very strong values of environment. They made an, a decision to change their investment criterion some four or five years ago, not to invest, not to do uh, option appraisal on the basis of money, but to do option appraisal on the basis of carbon. And they were measuring carbon end to end, embodied carbon, operational carbon, etc. 
They have, as a result, prioritised projects which deliver lower carbon performance o over other, other projects in, in their capital programme, in investing in um, assets to support the water, water uh, sector in that part of the country. And that's the sort of performance they've been getting. Low carbon sustainability is delivering economic performance for that, for, for that, for that company. Um, this may well be the future in terms of accounting in carbon delivers economic prosperity also. Construction 2025 is where we are now. We've come a long way. We've set another set of very ambitious targets on how we want to improve. Constructing excellence would add a couple of more targets at the bottom there. Less waste, you know, until we're not killing anybody on our sites, we, 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 we can't call ourselves a, mo a modern industry. But this is... These are the sorts of themes, people smart, sustainable, that we now think the future holds for, for the UK. And for those sort of around who've, who've been involved, who've looked at aspects of, of what we do in the UK, you know, whether you're a contracting business, a client business, to achieve that level of breakthrough and change, those are some of the themes we think are going to be necessary. This is the sort of journey. Respect for people, the anchor of sustainability for all the reasons I've suggested. Collaboration. You got that right, you can start to use the very advanced modern tools and, and, and techniques that, that BIM gives you. And I think we're going to move much more, especially in new build, towards a lean and, and industrialized industry. With the skill shortages we've got, with, a t with the pressure on, on, on environmental performance, with the pressure on cost, you're going to see an industry which is a lot more about designing from first principles for off-site manufacture, prefabrication. It's a safer environment as part from anything else. This is what we mean by collaboration. I nearly replicated Vassan's, Gassan's um, uh, triangle there. Um, six success factors for collaboration, and a lot of this is about influencing clients and, and, and tier one supply chain. Success when it comes to delivering projects, we found in the UK has been a lot about procuring integrated project teams, moving away from a linear design, bid, build process towards something which is much more about procuring tier one, tier two, specialist contractors, even key manufacturers such as the uh, uh, modular suppliers uh, at a much earlier stage in the process because all those people contribute to design in the modern industry. We build such complicated stuff now, whether it's buildings or infrastructure, there is no architect or engineer who is superhuman enough to be able to do those jobs on their own without the support of the specialist contractors, the product manufacturers, the product suppliers. It needs to be a proper team effort to do this stuff well. And that means aligned commercial arrangements. It means people being paid on a win-win basis. It does not mean old-fashioned, lowest price, and let's do a deal, and let's drive that price even lower. The more that price is driven lower, the less, the more we're driving out value, and in particular, the opportunity for value in the long term, in the long term operation of facilities. And above all else, customers want value. And we need to understand, as I showed earlier, clients are motivated by a lot of things, but we need to understand how clients and users measure value. And sometimes that's in money, but it's going increasingly to be in carbon, as I hope I've successfully um, argued. But the final concluding point is let's think about what people are trying to buy here. When we looked at office buildings in London in the late 1990s, if you had spent £1 million building it in the first place, over 20 years, you'd have spent £5 million operating it. That's not just the energy cost, that's the maintenance, it's the operation, it's the redecoration, it's the churn, it's the refit every five years because there's a new tenant. But compared with those numbers, they are dwarfed by the cost of the company's salaries that occupy that building over 20 years, 200 on the same scale. Let me add two more numbers in for you. Design on that scale is 0.1, and the value earned by the business occupying those office buildings is 2,000. The only reason that company invests in the office building is to earn the 2,000. The ratio, therefore, of value to design input is 20,000 to one over 20 years. Now, I'm not saying these are the, number, the right numbers here. I'm not even saying they're the right numbers in the UK for different but what I am saying is work those numbers out. And if you work those numbers out, you'll start thinking right to left. You'll start building, you'll start designing a built environment which is fit for purpose.
And if you do that, you'll conclude